right. The only thing that could be better than this, Harry, is we're both in Montreal eating at Walensky's or something right now. Yes, Schwartz's Beauties. Exactly. Moishes. Moishes. Moishes, Walensky's, Schwartz's. After we say all that, they're definitely going to think we're Irish. There's no doubt about it. Yes. Uh, anyways, welcome, Harry. Um, first of all, thanks so much for participating in our uh, Leaders Who Care video series. I know. My pleasure. Thanks. I know you'll you'll add value as you always have um, in all the different things that we do, and uh, um, nothing like having a fellow Montrealer, big hockey fan. Uh, that's the best people I have on this video series. So um, good job. Um, can you um, can we start just by you like introducing yourself, if you will, and just giving us a brief background? Sure. My name is Harry Epstein. I'm uh, CEO of P Chip Corporation, a micro chip company that's focuses on tagging technologies for blockchain, Internet of Things, security, anti-counterfeiting, and more. I'm also the founder of the Nexus Initiative, yep. which is an organization that focuses on global challenges. Our goal is to be impactful. We are um, work on bottoms-up solutions as opposed to policy and top-down solutions. Um, I'm married. I have four children that all right now are living with me thanks to our, our viral situation. Um, I'm a classical pianist. I, I play every day. I, I was playing hockey two, three times a week until uh, the rink closed down. And, and I happen to be writing a book on theoretical physics, believe it or not. One of my passions. And just for our audience, you know, imagine Harry writing that book in the dressing room in the intermission between periods. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, there, there are some topics that I just don't get into in certain venues, and that would be one of them. <laughs> um, but you could do it because you know how to make stuff happen. Um, um, hey, you know, I, I, um, I always like to find out why, why people are doing things, how they're doing it and whatnot. So tell me a little bit about your why. More importantly, um, why do you do all that you do? Uh, I've had a belief in, in trying to be globally impactful as opposed to just sitting around and, and, and being materialistic. That, that seems to have given my life meaning. And, and one of the areas of focus that I have uh, from a global perspective is the concept of survivability. Right. I don't believe it's enough just to be sustainable anymore. I think we have to look further. And as we look uh, the next five, 10, 15, 25 years, the concept of survivability will be important. Also, I'm a big believer on, on uh, mentoring and, and the sharing of wisdom. I think wisdom has become more and more obsolete and we have to train ourselves, our family, our leaders to, to, to have more patience and, and to think in terms of wisdom. Not to be cute, but I think that's actually a super wise statement. Um, you know, there's, you see things like them in people interviewing um, on for virtual reality, Holocaust survivors and other, all sorts of other people to, to have the information of the knowledge that they have um, to add to all that we're doing, we're doing now. So, um, he just made me think of that when you when you said that is um, there's so much wisdom that we don't want to waste also. Yes. Um, you know, it's taken decades, and especially, you know, you've done great stuff, including with Nexus Initiative, which I've been fortunate to be invited to. You've done great stuff in in showing that you can you can, you know, be aimed for profit and for good at the same time. And for some reason it's taken us decades, literally to get to the point where, you know, leaders of corporate realize that they're aligning their brands with social impact is not only now necessary to attract the best people, but it is really good for business. And your background is really strategic consulting, um, great relationships, helping innovators, um, and creating big ideas. Can you, um, I've kind of different, I've kind of given the answer to some degree already, but can you, you know, it's a little bit of a push question too. Can you, Kind of describe why, what differentiates you as one of the leaders who care with respect to your experiences and what you see in the future? To be effective as a corporation today, you just can't rely on yourself. You have to figure out the type of ecosystem and have an ecosystem philosophy to make things work. Um, how do you form strategic alliances? How do you have vision behind what's possible? What I've realized and it's taken me well into my 40s and 50s, is that I have a 
an ability to build community. And it's amazing what that means, because I, in my 20s and 30s, I, I never would have thought that that would be a key to be able to activate and make things happen. Uh, for example, I was able, with these types of skills, to form something called a holistic supply chain, uh, which is a way that we really should look at supply and demand. For example, did you know that over 27% of food in a starving world gets wasted and lost in supply chain? Also, uh, being strategic and innovative at the same time, having one without the other is is not optimal. I, I think it's important to, to, to speak both. Um, the final thing I think is, is this philosophy of kindness and, and of course integrity. The, the, the interesting thing about being in America is I've noticed that kindness is sort of perceived as weakness. And I don't believe in that. I believe that it, it is more of a strength. Yeah, it um, kind of reminds me a little bit about uh, my grandfather, you know, used to, um, I used to take walks when I was a little kid and um, we'd walk and he'd say hi and smile to everybody. And after a while I said, we call him Zeta. I said, Zeta, how do you know all these people? And he said, I don't know most of them, but it seems like when I smile, they smile, they're happy. And then I smile again and I'm happy. So it works for me. And it was brilliant that it stuck with me forever. Um, another thing really related to where we are now that I think most grandparents say is that um, as long, you know, with the Kiev accent they had, as long as we have our health, that's the most important thing, right? Yeah. Um, so with the speed of technology right now, which you're totally familiar with, and COVID impacting us all over the place, there seems to be a little bit of more time to reflect and an awakening of people. How do you see the infamous future of work and also doing business changing short term, long term? You know, there's that, that set of questions could require at least six hours of me talking. I know. <laughs> That's why we're going to make it. And can you show yourself a little bit more? You're getting too low there. From, from a different point of view, um, when I look at what's going on and I've looked at what's happened over the last six months or the last year or two years or five years in, in terms of global challenges, um, I've come to believe that we have to focus on resilient strategies. I, I could talk about what it's like to, to have more telecommuters and all that stuff, but really the core of what I've been thinking about uh, living during these times is how truly resilient are we? How truly resilient are, is our food supply chain, our energy sources, the way that, that um, our businesses work? This concept of resilience strategies, I think, is, has, has been on my mind and has given me a lot to think about. The other thing I've been thinking about as well is you look at all the people who are unemployed or you look at the what's positive that we see happening to the environment with less things happening. We've been on a, a, a economies of scale growth strategy for, for over a century. I've been thinking about this concept of economies of scaling down. How do we change the way we work? How do we not base everything on the, the grow or die scenario? But can we scale down in effective ways and how would that happen? So these are some of the things that I think we require different thinking moving forward. Yeah, I, I, I know we can talk along and then you, you addressed some of these things at a global conference we had a, a while back too that I thought were, were brilliant. I noticed another thing that's, that's become very critical, basically, um, being that it's not just about money, is that business leaders who care are realizing that, or let me ask you in a different way, what role do you see them playing you know, to ensure that their employees, their talent um, are taken care of, their financial well-being, their physical well-being, and especially their mental well-being is taken care of in the, in the sense that they get it's good for business, but they know it also flows all the way into the community. I, I think that it begins with, with culture, corporate culture, because that's what empowers caring for employees and how healthy are they are, or their financial wellness programs or anything, uh, or their, their sustainability policies. So my first piece of advice would be 
don't take a corporate job where corporate profits are the only metric. If you do, then that's a slippery slope. It's a sign. Everything else that they might be talking about is, is really secondary and not important to them. So what is the, the, the culture? Understand that culture that you might be getting into. Now, if it's something that you can build, consider the culture that you would want to build. Because at the end of the day, it's all about culture to make any of these things happen in a company. Yeah, super, it's super interesting. Um, kind of answered the next question I'm going to ask, but I'm going to, I'm going to stick, sneak another one in there for a minute. You play hockey, you play the piano. You're, I said I wasn't going to call you a dude, but you're a smart dude. <laughs> um, and, you know, you just, you just you, literature, the whole bit you cover. Talk to me a little bit about those aren't just extra things to do that you like to do or whatnot, but in a lot of ways, they're interactive and they overlap and in a lot, in a lot of different manners, don't they? Yeah, they do. Um, I, I do all these different kinds of things. Connecting with people is fun. Uh, one of the terms that I've learned uh, a few years ago, someone said to me, and it, it sort of stuck with me, is what it is to be a lifelong learner. So being a lifelong learner, but also being a lifelong creator. I love learning. I love creating new things and thinking differently. So I have a whole passion around it. And even on the hockey rink, besides the relational aspect and the health aspect, there's consistently learning about hockey, how to play better, how to work better as a team. Um, and even that simple concept of, of physical activity can be made fun and, and a learning experience. So it's for me, it's always been about that concept of learning and creating. Yeah, no, I, I love it. Um, I guess the last question, which you've kind of answered, but I'm going to give you a little more specific. Um, there's a graduating class that's, uh, as we all know, is kind of missed out on their graduation per se, and so it's going to be a unique graduation they'll remember. Um, I'm a, if I'm a graduate, I come over to you and I say, man, everything going on, I just graduated. What next? What do I do now? Oh, you know, that's as people figure out what they want to do or who they want to be or how do they want to be in whatever job they get, because uh, it's it's a it's a mishmash of, of stuff when you start to look at it. Um, you know, there's two things that I'd want them to think about, first of all, and, and look at themselves and recognize in themselves. First of all, are they a strong generalist? Have they been focused on one thing and, and that defines them? Or have they been taught to learn uh, about different fields and as many as possible so they can integrate their thinking? Because I believe that strong generalists become the best leaders. Strong generalists have the most flexibility and the more ability to find work and excel in work. So that would be the first thing that I wanna say. The, the second thing I wanna say is, is about having a personal five-year plan. There was a very interesting uh, survey done in the late 30s to graduating classes at Harvard for their MBA program. Now, at that time, the Harvard MBA program was the program of leaders. The leaders of the biggest corporations and the presidents of the country, et cetera, had a Harvard MBA. So they had a series of questions that they asked these Harvard graduates and uh, they, they did it over, I think, three years. And then they tracked all these graduates through their entire career until they were 65. And they looked at where they did and what they had done. And they compared the outcomes with how they answered those survey questions. And they found one major uh, fact. And that was only 3% of those graduates said they had a personal five-year plan. And at the end of that, their careers, it turned out that those 3% out-earned the entire 97% of the rest of the class. Wow. Not per capita, completely out-earned them. Wow. So the power of what it means to have a five-year plan and how it gets you to think about yourself in the future, I think is very powerful. So that would be the, 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 the second thing that, that I would tell graduates moving forward. Sounds like a almost a more granular visualization of where you want to be. Yeah. Very yeah. cool. 
Thanks, Harry. Really appreciate it as always. My pleasure.